Yeah, I mean, you can send me the paper and then uh, right. talk about it. Okay, okay. so um, last uh, colloquium of the semester, I guess. So it's um, we had, I think, a, a great semester with many interesting uh, presenters. Um, so uh, today, um, I'm happy that uh, Amy Pond is, is here. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Texas AMN, and um, uh, she works on uh, international and comparative political economy. Uh, she's working uh, in exciting projects on uh, special interest groups. Uh, so um, today, she will be talking about uh, political ownership. Um, I think it's a very interesting paper. So super happy to have you here. Um, 15 minutes for you, and then I will keep the queue as usual for uh, questions. Good. Okay. Cool. Oh, and any announcements? So, oh, okay. So I think we order uh, lunch for more people than that people ended up arresting. So if you if you want to have lunch and keep talking with Amy and and the rest of the people after the colloquium, just go to the library, third floor. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's invited. That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. I'm thrilled to be here, uh, and thank you all for taking some time out of your day at this very very busy time in the semester. I very much appreciate it. Um, really, I want to hear from you, uh, so I'm going to try to keep it pretty short. I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of the paper. Uh, this is co-authored work with Tim Betts, also at Texas A&M University. Uh, and this is very early stages in this process. Um, so I think really the only thing that we really love about the paper is the title. Um, <laughs> we really like political ownership. And other than that, we're pretty flexible. So any comments that you have uh, about the theory, the empirics, uh, yeah. oh, you didn't like the title? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, I'm happy to talk about why we like the title, too, if you're interested. Uh, this is part of a broader set of projects that we have on financial assets and ownership structure. Um, and the first sort of part of this project is uh, basically that international partnerships, particularly financial par partnerships, um, provide firms with coverage under bilateral investment treaties, and so that's a way that firms um, can go international and get property rights protection from their own government. We have a couple papers in this vein. Um, we also have a few papers where we look at both uh, governments as both borrowers and regulators of financial markets. And the idea here is that governments can impose regulations that force, especially financial actors, um, to hold their own debt. Um, I also have a paper about how uh, we tend to think of financial markets as constraining policymakers, um, but actually financial assets, still their underlying assets have the same characteristics that they had before they were traded on financial markets. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about any of these papers um, in more detail if you're at all interested. Um, what I'm going to turn to today is really that politically connected owners, um, the relationship basically between ownership and political connections, and how if you have political connections, you tend to attach a larger value to a firm than you would if you didn't have political connections. And that opens up the opportunity for politically connected buyers or takeovers um, of firms that are owned by people who lack political connections. OK, so the broad question that we're asking in this paper is how do political conditions affect ownership? And we're combining two sort of existing strands of, of literature. Uh, the first is that political connections elevate profit. So through preferential regulations, um, government contracts, or the absence of predatory regulations, the imposition of lower tax rates, um, we see that political <coughs> firms that have political connections tend to have higher profits. Um, at the same time, we know that political connections are not constant over time. That when a new political leader comes to power, he often has a new set of political connections. And so just combining these two ideas together then, we expect that when a new political leader comes to power, they're going to have a new set of political connections. And these people with political connections are going to um, take the opportunity to take over ownership of firms. OK, so political turnover should increase ownership turnover. If this is all you take away from this talk. This is, this is basically the main point. Um, and we think that this can happen through two mechanisms. So when I started working on this paper, I was most interested in this takeover aspect. And then Tim and I have sort of gone rounds and rounds about all the different mechanisms. Um, that potentially could lead to this ownership turnover. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear any comments that you have in this area as well. Um, the other is purchases. So if a politically connected buyer associates a higher value with the firm than someone who lacks political connections, then that creates this opportunity for them to, to actually purchase the firm. And I'll show you that in just a second. 
So the takeover part, this is really, I think, most clearly building on the work of Stanislav Marcus's book in, in 2015. He documents many cases of raiders taking over firms in Ukraine and Russia. Um, and the idea here is that and he, he sort of goes through the process for you, which is really nice. So what does a raider do? Well, first they collect detailed information on the ownership structure of the firm. And actually, uh, publicly traded firms are very attractive for this because all of that information on the ownership structure of a firm is available publicly, and so it's really easy to access. Um, and then they sort of create a legal case against the firm. This often involves like state inspectors. Um, sometimes it's allegations that the firm hasn't been paying their fair share in taxes, or uh, they haven't had the correct um, contracts in place. And this, basically, they initiate a lawsuit. And this causes the firm to have to pay for the, to, to defend themselves, right? Um, and they just keep sort of badgering the firm owners until eventually they sell the asset, often at a huge discount. And that allows the raider to take over. Um, then sometimes they'll transfer the ownership through like five or six different um, channels to make sure that this ownership change is irreversible. So even if it comes out that these initial claims were um, unfounded, it's just gone through too many uh, ownership changes for them to actually reverse that process. Uh, so this is a pretty well-documented process. So this is the sort of thing that we were thinking of, where somebody who has political connections is going to have an easier time engaging with um, often courts and also state inspectors. Right? They're going to be able to get preferential legal decisions. Okay. The other mechanism, though, would really just be through a, a purchase. Um, so think of this big pink dot as the value of a firm to an owner who lacks political connections. And if you compare that to the value of a firm to an owner with political connections, right, that's going to be larger. And so that opens up this area here. Any price that's sort of in between these two valuations would be acceptable both to the, the previous owner who lacked political connections and to a future owner who has political connections. So it doesn't have to be this like nefarious story where you have um, a, a political actor taking over the firm. It doesn't have to be government expropriation, although those are sort of often the cases we have in mind, I think, as political scientists. Uh, okay, so again, political turnover should increase ownership turnover. And we think that this should especially be the case for firms with more immobile assets because they're more vulnerable to government regulation. Um, and they're also more vulnerable to, to take over, actually. Um, and we think that this should also be more prevalent in countries with corruption, because those are the conditions where these political connections are really important, and where, where a politically connected owner would have a much higher valuation for the firm. OK, so empirically, um, we're going to introduce data on changes to the majority owner of the 5,000 largest publicly traded firms in 69 middle income countries. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this data collection process more in, in detail if you'd like. Um, we, we selected the 5,000 largest firms because there's just tons of missing data in the Orbis data set. Even among the largest firms, there's still lots and lots of missing data. Uh, so this, is, this was our way to try to mitigate missingness. But yeah, of course, it's somewhat problematic, I think. Um, even with this limitation to the 5,000 largest firms, collecting data on these countries, like China's um, list of owners of the 5,000 largest firms ends up taking up like 20 spreadsheets. Uh, and this is just the last 10 years. Um, we, we did the middle income countries because we think that these are the countries where this is most likely to apply. We didn't think that political ownership probably um, plays a large role in OECD countries, although maybe it does. We're sort of rethinking that now. Um, and then we didn't code the low income countries uh, because many of them don't have meaningful stock markets. Uh, and so just talking about publicly traded firms in that context doesn't make a lot of sense. OK, uh, and then we have changes in political leadership from the Archegos data set. Uh, we have the Bayesian Corruption Indicator to measure corruption. This just has really great coverage. Um, and then intangible assets also from Orbis. OK, so basically what we find is a change in political leadership increases the probability of ownership change by about 6%. That's in a baseline model without any control variables or anything. These estimates are not super duper stable. Um, that's the technical term. <laughs> um, so they, they get a lot larger in, the, in some of the models with control variables, um, but sometimes they also lose significant. 
Uh, okay, and then the marginal effect of a change in political, political leadership as a function of corruption, right? At low levels of corruption, we see that there's, from, for most of the data, right, it's insignificant here when the Bayesian corruption indicator, indicator is really low, uh, but for most of the data, there's a positive effect, this is the zero line, of political leadership on ownership change, and you can see that the effect is much larger in countries that are more corrupt. Okay, the intangible assets, so um, a firm that has more intangible assets. Uh, intangible assets are literally assets that don't have a physical presence. So this is in, in comparison to tangible assets. Um, so these would be expected to be more mobile. These are things like branding, intellectual property, um, operating practices, anything that's not physically there. Um, so here's the zero line. Um, so you can see this is a little bit, this isn't exactly what we expected, right? So low levels of intangible assets, we would expect um, ownership change, or I'm sorry, political change to have a positive effect on, on ownership change. Uh, it's significant at the 10% level, um, but we don't have strong expectations for why it would actually be negative down here. Maybe there's something going on with like uncertainty introduced by changes in political leadership um, that just causes these firms to be less likely to, to change hands at that time. Um, but it's, anyway, I'm happy to hear your thoughts on this. Okay, so that's kind of the big, that's kind of the overview of the project. Well, I talked really fast. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about some of the implications, some of the reasons why we think this is interesting. Um, okay, so the first is that we think the literature just hasn't put enough emphasis on ownership in general, that actually asset ownership is quite flexible. Um, so we as political scientists often take asset ownership as given and derive political preferences from it, right? We have pocketbook voting. Um, and so what we wanted to point out in this paper is actually that ownership itself can be political uh, and maybe we shouldn't be treating it as exogenous. Um, and then also I think there's implications for, I think I'm in the right room for this, uh, for economic underdevelopment. Um, so when we think about political institutions and corruption leading to lower levels of growth, we tend to think about the absence of property rights enforcement, which undermines incentives to invest in future growth. Um, but here, it also just might be the case that we have less competent owners. Um, if people are taking over firms for political reasons, it's probably not the people best suited to manage those firms. Um, we also, so this is something that uh, some of my other work has touched on. Um, we expect, right, as political scientists, that immobile assets are going to be taxed at higher rates than mobile assets uh, because it's harder for those firms to withhold those assets by definition from government um, taxation. We actually don't have strong evidence for that uh, in countries with weak political institutions. So in non-democratic countries or non-OECD countries, uh, you see this in some of Nate Jensen's work, some of my work, uh, some of my colleague Florian Hollenbach's recent work. Um, and so I think that Tim and I actually have a little bit of an explanation for this. So rather than taxing immobile assets at higher rates in countries with weak property rights, the government instead uh, finds some way to reassign ownership of those firms. Um, and so when we see lower tax rates of these firms with immobile assets, uh, that's probably because this is another policy benefit being extended to those politically connected individuals. Um, so, I don't know, these are the implications that I think are most interesting, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the project. So thank you all very much. So I think I have Dean, and then you, so it's... Yeah, I like the question, trying to understand uh, the link between political institutions and firm behavior and firm ownership. Why you didn't mention Coast? You can ah. it later. But I've got a few other. Trying to think about the implied model here. Um, all the decision uh, focus of the firm is on on ownership. And there's other things that firms can do. And firms can create a board of directors. So firms live in a world where they know politics can change. Mm -hmm. So they like to anticipate that. I know there's work um, from U.S. corporations that looks at how how firms construct the board of their boards of directors. Differently, if they're in a political environment or a less political environment, uh, so you can, you don't have to take over the firm. You can change the board of directors. You can change your behavior. Just do what the new leaders want. So it's not 
clear that why this is the mechanism, uh, there should be a low cost mechanism to re respond to uh, uh, political uh, changes. And on the, on the tangible assets, I think it might be more useful to think about specific assets versus tangible mm -hmm. as the ones that can sort of leave you stuck. I mean, tangible assets can be specific, they can be very generic, as you're mm -hmm. talking about soybeans, you want a soybean mm -hmm. oil processing plant, well, those, those soy, soybeans are soybeans more or less, but if you're talking about some power company that requires a certain kind of coal, that's a different thing. So maybe that's, maybe uh, thinking about the assets a little differently would, would do some more. Mm -hmm. um, Do we want to collect, or should I mm -hmm. respond? How are we? Yeah, go, go, you want to respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I think these are great questions. Thank you. Um, so why not look at managers? So I, I agree that this is, that would probably be more efficient from the firm's perspective. Um, but especially in a country with a really weak property rights enforcement and lots of corruption, I don't know why the government would limit themselves. Um, so why would, just putting somebody on a board of directors be enough to appease the government. Like I, I think probably both things are true, uh, and maybe one applies at at a more like. Well, you might interact this say if you could get data on this the structure of government uh, in place. So I don't think you see takeovers of U.S. corporations when you get a new president. Right, and that's uh, why we didn't so, include so the OECD that's, countries. That's what's kind of missing here. Why is this the? You know, why is you know, why is this kind of political change? It might, you might, you know, there may be both things going on. I would, you know, that's the way I think about it. Um, yeah. And then, and then thinking about measuring political change. So I don't know exactly how you measure, but this executive can change, the legislature can change. This is just executive change. change. Yeah. So, you know, it might, you know, that, that also depends on the structure of the, the, the powers across the, those groups within a, within a government as well. So, um, I guess I think, you know, you're just getting started. I know so these are things that you. Yeah, this is, these are great suggestions. Um, I don't have data on the specific assets. I have data on immobile assets as well. Um, it just, there's a lot more missingness there. Uh, so the intangible assets was the one that we, we just had the most data coming out of Orbis on. Uh, and missingness is just a huge problem with the Orbis data uh, when you get outside of like um, OECD countries. Uh, but thank you, those, these points are really helpful. Sorry, it's, Tim. I can't remember your name, so sorry. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, Tim. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, you saw it, like, very good, interesting paper. I, I was just wondering about the sort of the two conditioning factors you have here. Mm -hmm. um, so first, the, the corruption one. Um, I like very much the discussion of Marcus, and so I was wondering, mm -hmm. you know, and you, and you said in your talk the way he lays it out for you pretty, and you're kind of following that. So one question is, is that sort of model that Marcus lays out about the companies like from Russia and Ukraine, mm -hmm. are you reasonably comfortable with that sort of the story that goes on elsewhere, mm -hmm. right? And if so, you know, you might want to go all in, if you want to go all, all in on that and say, well, then that, then that suggests that you might think a little more carefully about how you're conditioning on that. Because I read the Marcus story uh, as that motivates your corruption. Um, mm -hmm. Interaction, but that corruption, if I understand the Bayesian measure, is very broad mm -hmm. in most general terms. It seems to me that you could sort of get the, the empirics and the theory sharper, but you want to sharpen the theory first, mm -hmm. right? Then, then you want to make a decision. The corruption finding is very nice and strong and looks robust. Mm -hmm. I think it could be even sharper if you sort of you just this is just what it is about. It. This is the process to go through. This is the, if there is not much. Right, if exactly, you can think about some of the polity data that might help you get at whether or not there's much separation of powers, executive dominance. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things to me almost seem follow more theoretically from your story than just this broad corruption indicator. Um, and then the second thing about the so the other one was the um, remind me the other thing you're conditioning on is uh, intangibles. Okay. The immobile or in this case mobile assets. Okay. Draw a blank on why I thought that was something to talk about, but I guess okay. So I'll just piggyback on on Dean's point about the political ownership then as well. My my last point. Um, 
Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Or oh, two things about it. One thing is it's not necessarily a, a dummy variable, right? It could be trying to figure out change in partisanship, change in, you know, does it change, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on in South Africa, what's going on in South Africa, does that really change in executive ownership if it's all within the, you know, similar ruling blocks? Mm -hmm. and so that's going to be qualitatively different than a radical change that went on in Poland or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's something there to play around with um, rather than just saying change or not. Um, yeah. And then, uh, if I think of my other comment, I'll let you know, but, but um, I think that could be something to play around with as well. Yeah, th that's great. Um, so I really like this idea of executive dominance, and I think building on Dean's comment as well, the just bringing in some of these other political factors. Uh, I have looked at the changes in partisanship, so is there, like, is there just, is it, is, is it the case that this executive turnover was actually a turnover in partisanship and then also like looking specifically at those cases where it's going, I called it going left, like where the change in partisanship is going left. And it doesn't look like there's much going on there, but I think I, I could just report those results in the appendix or something for people who are, who are interested. Because I think that that is like as a political scientist, that's kind of one of the things that you think of as probably being relevant. Yeah, so um, again, really, really interesting. And I was just wondering if, yeah, I'm not sure if Marcus talks about this, I'm not familiar with that particular literature, but the difference between the private and the public, I know your research is only focused on publicly traded uh, companies, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if privately held companies would be more or less vulnerable to this? And I ask that because that would essentially, I mean, if they are more or less, wouldn't that structure their incentives to become a publicly traded organization? And Mm -hmm. If your thesis holds, and wouldn't we see, and if they are less vulnerable, if they're more vulnerable, the private ones and public, and if your thesis holds, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't we see a, maybe a, a decrease in IPOs after political turnover or something like that? I was just, I was just wondering where we could take this into the private realm because I know your data is limited to the public. Yeah, uh, I love this comment. Thank you. I have to, I'll have to think more about this, uh, but this is. This is really closely related to another paper that I'm working on about like the incentives to go public, uh, and we don't we don't have that data here, but yeah, I think I think that's very interesting. Um, I don't actually have a like strong intuition about whether this would be more likely to hold with publicly traded companies or private companies. Right. Um, I would have like I would have expected actually the publicly traded companies to be a much harder case. These tend to be much larger firms. This is a pretty, like, when governments take them over, it's going to be really clear. Um, right? Like, everybody's going to know that this happened. Whereas a private firm, I feel like they can often sweep that under the rug. Um, but Marcus's work makes me think that the opposite would be true uh, because there is so much more financial information available yeah. about the publicly traded firms. Uh, and so, because that's true, then perhaps this phenomenon is actually more likely to hold with publicly traded firms. So I don't have like a strong theoretical intuition right now. I'll need to think about it more. But I, th I think that this is, I think that's a really interesting area for exploration in the future. And I, I haven't seen much work on that in political science. Um, if people have, please send it my way. I'm, I'm really interested. Um, so this is like a hodgepodge of comments. And I'm realizing after Tony's comment that this, that the, the Gelbach paper that I kind of mentioned last night uh -huh. is probably more about private ownership, but I did look it up and it's called Hiding, I found it well. hiding Control, yeah, after our... right? All of our expiration and political connections, but it did make me think that is it possible there's something else going on, right? Like changing ownership in a public firm is really clear and obvious kind of to everyone. Mm -hmm. It seems like it would be. And I'm curious as to like whether, and this may be a little bit related to this sort of team comment, is there other thing, are there other things that the firm could be doing mm -hmm. um, that you're not observing that this is just, which is, would explain why these results are not quite as stable as you might hope them to be, is that they are sort of imperfect um, signals of something else going on, which then makes me wonder about the timing of everything, which is to say, like, how long, so you've mm -hmm. got the, the, the Marcus story of the Raiders, mm -hmm. and then you've got a more benign story of the purchasing, and my question is, is like, A, how long does it take companies to really make use of these political connections? Mm -hmm. How are they realized? over what time frame, especially given that if we think, you know, you make this comment that elections, election timing is exogenous. It is exogenous, but it's not unpredictable, mm -hmm. right? And so what is the time frame in which we would actually expect this to happen, especially given that your lag 
is really like your lag change in ownership the year before you measure, right? Like if I understand your results, which I may not, but the um you have your um it's all contemporaneous, nothing's lagged. It's like lag controlling ownership change. It's maybe it's Oh, this is, uh, that's just a lag dependent variable. Yeah, so it's a lag dependent variable. That's only in one of the models. Though. Okay, okay, it's so only one of the models. I'd just be curious as to whether you see any of this happening before the election. Yeah, okay. Right, especially in anticipation of something, and that whether that might make your results more, like if it's the year before or the year of, what might happen there. So I was thinking about the timing and whether the breeders story, again, sort of since comment actually happens that way every time or whether there are mm -hmm. sort of people, you know, um, things happening in a sort of different order, or different pace. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, so I, yeah, I think this is a great question. Uh, I'm sure there's other things that the firms are doing. Like I don't, I'm not purporting to capture everything that firms are doing to protect themselves. Um, uh, and yeah, maybe these represent the cases where the firms failed to protect themselves and the like having lots of tangible assets is just like one way to proxy for firms that are unlikely to be able to protect themselves in other ways. Um, how, how long to make use of the political connections? So we've been thinking of this as sort of, everybody can see down the game tree, they can see that like once this um, new political leaders in power, they can see that people with political connections are going to have higher profits um, in the future. And so even so we just look for the contemporaneous effect. Um, I was thinking more that like this effect might still be happening in the year after um, the leadership change and the year after that. And so we've looked for that a little bit and it doesn't look like there's anything there. So it seems to all be happening pretty quickly. Um, and in the year before the leader comes to power, there is a slightly elevated um, change in ownership, uh, which I was a little bit surprised by. Well, that would fit a little bit with the what the Gelbach claim kind of was that there's this sort of anticipated change, but it's more on the private sort of like hidden yeah. sector. So I, the signal would be very different, right? Like with their... So I think so. We want to look at that more, um, and I think Tim was looking a little bit at um, mm -hmm. in cases where the ownership change is predictable. Um, so where like the election result wasn't a toss up, where people were able to anticipate um, the, the change in, in leadership, that effect is larger in the year before. And so we think that that's consistent with our story uh, and we just haven't, like this is, this is hot off the press or not even the press, right? Hot off the email. Um, so I think that's a, that's a direction that we want to look at in more detail too. Uh, and I, I think though, like, so the thing, the thing that makes me nervous is the like, uh, monetary expansions and the run up to an election, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, so that's something that I want to account for and want to make sure that we do that really carefully before uh, making too many broad claims. So, Simon? Oh, okay. Um, so, I have kind of three sets of um, questions and comments. So, first of all, I think that this is a really um, exciting, fun um, project. So, I'm really looking forward to how this progresses. Um, so my first question has to, it picks up on some strands of kind of the theory side that others have mentioned, um, especially Tim really thinking about scope conditions, especially since Marcus, who I have not read, but I'm now very much looking forward to reading, um, really built this around Russia and Ukraine, which is a particular type of political economy. Um, I'm thinking in particular of Ben Rush Snyder's work on hierarchical capitalism, kind of um, from a varieties of capitalism type approach. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of big takeaways from his work, um, and he, you know, specializes especially in, in Latin America, um, is that in um, countries that are characterized by weak minority investor protections, mm -hmm. that oftentimes you get um, kind of structures of, um, of, like ownership structures that are really built around family connections. And those are precisely the types of firms that um, are less likely to go public, right, mm -hmm. as well. Um, but also are like a completely different way of structuring um, s structuring your mm -hmm. um, ownership. And I would imagine it would be much more challenging to unravel um, in this sort of mm -hmm. kind of argument that you're making here. And so part of the reason why you might not be finding you know, really robust results is that perhaps that 
this is a little bit predicated on some other components of the political economy that are not accounted for just through corruption, but this how kind of mm -hmm. um, firm ownership is sort of tends to be structured in particular economies. Um, also, in terms of timing, um, the fact that it that the timing is really concentrated in the year of the election mm -hmm. is surprising to me because I would anticipate that if the mechanism is really that kind of story that you that you took from Marcus about kind of finding legal challenges mm -hmm. to mount um, ways of kind of wearing down the current owners, I would anticipate that that would take time. So the fact that you're not mm -hmm. seeing that there's a kind of um, continued effect is a little bit concerning to me. So I would really investigate that a little bit more. And I'd also say that I know that you use, um, you also kind of subset to presidential elections because that, that um, in, in some of your analysis mm -hmm. and things um, for the most part hold, but especially when you also have um, countries that, um, that have other systems, I would definitely account for economic crises because economic crises are going to um, force new elections. Oftentimes there's turnover and you can imagine that there's turnover in ownership um, for reasons that have nothing to do <coughs> with the election itself. It's actually that the election and um, the ownership is being driven by the economic crisis rather than anything else. Um, and then finally on the intangible assets side, um, first of all, my, my first kind of question is, because I, I thought it was really weird that the intangible assets actually um, had it, this like negative effect, mm -hmm. which you, you pointed out in your presentation. I'm wondering if um, you have data on which of these firms are owned domestically or foreign, because I wonder, especially if a lot of these are kind of like higher tech companies, if these are foreign firms, and that maybe the reason why there's not as much turnover is because these are foreign, these are held um, by foreign um, individuals or entities, and so therefore they're, they may be less kind of um, concerned about the domestic politics, which that in and of itself is a whole, opens up a whole can of worms. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how much you want to go down that route, but I'm just wondering kind of that made me think in generally how many of the firms in your data set are foreign or owned versus domestic owned, and how might that kind of change um, the story that you're trying to tell here. And then finally on that point, I wonder um, if instead of intangible assets, if it might be more useful to think about kind of um, specific sectors that might be more, um, that that might yeah. be more vulnerable, such as infrastructure. And also I was thinking pre like companies that were previously SOEs because they are probably easier to take over for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are great comments. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot. Um, yeah, um, so I can look at the varieties of capitalism approach. That's something that I that we hadn't really thought about um, yet. So I think, like right now, this is going to end up getting absorbed in the country fixed effects. Uh, there's just not a lot of variation in the varieties of capitalism stuff, and the economic crisis is going to be similar like right now we have change in GDP in the models and we have year dummies as well and so the I think crisis is a huge one that we needed to account for and that's one of the reasons why the change in GDP is in there um, which at least in my mind is a more nuanced measure of like economic conditions than these like crisis dummies uh, but I, I can throw the crisis I, could throw this in there I mean if you have like a yeah, it, I think it would be useful to at least check in robustness. Yeah, robustness. yeah, 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 sure. Um, and the year dummies too, I, I like that for capturing these like cross-national kind of shocks that everybody gets. Um, I don't have, so I just have like the identity of the um, owner, the person's name or the name of the firm that owns the other firm. Uh, and I don't have like an indication of whether that's domestic or foreign. Um, I'm sure that there's some way that I can play with that to figure it out. Uh, and I can certainly look at like a specific sector. So the specific sectors thing always feels super active to me. Um, right, like when I look at the, the sectors, like so I could look at like, is it mining? Um, I guess mining and infrastructure are ones that immediately come to mind that should be included in there. 
Uh, but some of the others, sometimes it's just not clear to me like whether it's fixed or not. And so I like these more continuous measures that like accounting for the sector, um, those firms that have more fixed assets. And I, I'm interested to hear like how how um, convinced you all are about the intangibles measure. It sounds like not very convinced. Uh, but in the tax literature, like firms that have more intangible assets pay lower taxes. Uh, it's not like so. So for me, like that makes me think that it's at least a decent proxy for how subject to government policy the firm is. Um, but I, I'm taking your comments that maybe this is not as, as nice of a measure as I had thought. Uh, so that's super useful. Thank you. So I will jump in the queue and then. <laughs> so, um, so one comment, there is a very interesting paper on what happened on the um, boards of directors during the Nazi regime. So I was trying to find the paper. I listened to the presentation a couple of years ago. I will send you the paper about essentially what happened with Jewish members on 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 on, com, on companies that have uh, Jewish members members in the in, in the board of directors, and that's that's something something that uh, maybe is interesting for you. The other thing that I was thinking is uh, what can go wrong on the on the estimation also on the the, the Ocean 80 problem. Yeah. And I think you are on the right track that the potential crisis could be a, a, an issue there because mm -hmm. it's so what happened is something like this is I am a sp so, so situations is deteriorating the economic situation is deteriorating as a consequence foreign investors are going out they are selling their assets to mm -hmm. domestic <coughs> investors and at the same time because you're in a crisis you also have a political mm -hmm. change yeah. whatever so that produced ca some kind of uh, very mm -hmm easy and, and oceanated problem, no? So I was thinking how to fix that. So maybe, can you, well, you have GDP, you, you mentioned you have changes in GDP. We've changed, so we have, we have maybe you GDP, can control GDP per capita and changes in GDP. Or, or maybe it's just ex stock exchange, uh, whatever the, 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 the index the, is, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what happened there? And maybe something interesting connected with that is to see some, um, Asymmetric effects. What happens if you're expecting a government that it will be more pro market or less pro market? Mm -hmm. What what is going on? It's essentially it's like what happening when the stock market is going up mm -hmm. with these type of problems. What happens when you're expecting the the stock market to went down mm -hmm. in the election or the political change window? No, mm -hmm. so that's that could be could be interesting. Mm -hmm. And the final thing I think maybe connect with one of Sarah's point is. Um, what happens if these firms belong to uh, countries or players with much more capacity to uh, protect those firms? So there is a literature in economics on why the Chinese are investing in some countries that they have like very really high country mm -hmm. risk, and essentially they is that well, there is a heterogeneous country risk. Uh, it's much it's much easier to default other countries than China for several reasons. Mm -hmm. So that could be something interesting to explore if you have a little bit of information on uh, who owns these firms and foreign investors. Um, that could be something interesting to, to explore too. But I don't know if your data set allows you. Sorry if it doesn't. Yeah, it, it is. That would be interesting. I don't think that we can. Uh, but maybe maybe I need to get more creative. Um, but yeah, the, the stock market performance should be pretty straightforward to put in there. Um, these so it, like you put market capitalization in here. Okay. Um, it's just like losing observations, right? The market capitalization mm -hmm. data is not that the coverage is not that great in middle income countries. It's quite good in OECD countries, but um, and we're already suffering from missing data concerns. Um, I don't know if I, if I call or, or no, did, sure. did I not thoroughly respond to no, your no, 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 no. <laughs> Somewhere <laughs> just comments. So uh... um, oh, I do have data on the board of directors. Uh, we just okay. we felt like it wasn't as, as much of a clean measure. And, and I agree, maybe there's some sort of substitution happening uh, where some firms are more likely to try to put somebody on the board to sort of. Um, well, maybe a lot of things are happening at once, and that would be mm -hmm. likely, I think. And if you yeah. show all that, that would yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what conditions do you get more of this act? Can I jump? Because like, if you think from the perspective of a gains of trade thing, mm -hmm. 
selling is kind of the very extreme thing. It's like just transferring the bribe through picking a new director and keeping everything running, especially if you're more competent running the firm, maybe it's, it it's be much more better. Outcome, it's yeah. much more efficient. No? Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, yeah, no, that, that point is well taken. I'm, I'm not sure that that would be enough to sort of satisfy political interests. I, uh, if, I mean, why settle for a board of directors when you can have a firm? But it, it's going to depend on some of the, it's going to depend uh, on like the cost of taking over the firm, right? Which will also be related to intangibles uh, and related to property rights in the country. Um, so I should say that the board of directors data that I have is not from Orbis. Uh, and so it's not a perfect, uh, it's, from, it's from WRDS, uh, People's IQ. And so it's, but you it's, can get board of directors data. You can get board, but that is like rocky too. But Orbis, I'm just kind of disillusioned with Orbis at this point. Um, but it's it's good. Like if it is like the best that we have, uh, and we've worked with like Thompson One, Emergent Online, WRDS. Uh, so the WRDS is like they have better, it seems like, data on board of directors. But all of our firms won't be. Okay. But most. So yeah, yeah. My, my name is Jason. I'm, I'm political science. Um, I guess I was interested in um, maybe disaggregating this uh, political leadership transition uh, variable. So it seems like you would have wide variation in how much political influence uh, leaders have after retiring across different institutional contexts. Um, and maybe like if it's the same. Party, you know, but like they just change the mm -hmm. top leader. That's different from mm -hmm. partisan change or even like, you know, regime type change or something like that. Um, and so, uh, might be interesting to sort of, you know, maybe some of those are more consistent with uh, uh, political turnover story and less vulnerable to like, you know, it's an actually an economic crisis that changed both of them. Mm -hmm. um, also, I guess. Uh, even in an authoritarian regime, you know, you have legislative, uh, like, uh, representation being important for political outcomes. I'm thinking of Roy Truex's paper um, about the returns to office, mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, separately on you know regime type, I guess there must be a lot of variation in terms of, you know, to what extent, uh, you have. I guess this is what you get with the executive restraints, right? right? But I like, like that idea, yeah. You know, like which ones are more dominated by the uh, executive which ones are, you know, um, yeah. more power is still residual within other institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some interaction between, you know, uh, that and how much change in your time would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really, I, I like the idea of the executive constraint because that's great. Thank you. Um, so the, the do, should I respond or do I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. I just want to make sure. Um, so the, the, transition in the um, political leadership, like how much of this is just like a the, a new person from the same party where we don't see much meaningful change. So we initially really wanted to use the um, data set that Ashley Leeds put together, which is like, did the, um, basically the support coalition change. I know that she's updating that data set, uh, but as of now, it only goes up through 2005, I think, which really just doesn't even overlap with our sample at all. Um, and so, so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to look at like, well, at least partisanship is a decent proxy. Like, if the partisan partisanship changed, that should me give us some measure of like continuation of existing policies. Uh, but I do think, especially in countries that don't have like, and, and maybe this is also calling for a better measure, but where they don't have like political parties with strong platforms, there's really more of a personalist regime turnover in the individual. Like even if they maybe come from the same party as the last guy, can really have meaningful effects, uh, and so that's something else that we should look at. That's, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, just bring that. Some of these are might be just kind of directions for related but future research because they might not fit in perfectly here, but. Um, we did some stuff recently on re reinvigorating corporate governance, especially in Europe and the U.S., and this whole movement toward benefit corporations. Um, and there's 3,000 plus of these here in the U.S. at this point. But in terms of like reinvigorating different power centers or, or ensuring the rights of maybe underrepresented groups in corporate governance, I'm wondering, I haven't seen any work at all basically done on how this movement is playing out 
in especially more authoritarian context or more developing context. I'm not sure if any of these you know, different corporate forums are getting traction. Mm -hmm. But if so, that could be kind of an interesting comparative thing to undertake um, to kind of get at you know, these, these issues about centralized power through the back door, basically, by having this kind of revitalized corporate law. Um, and then uh, bilateral investment treaties. We did a thing a few mm -hmm. years ago looking at trade seekers protections and how some of the more recently negotiated bits are pretty squarely focused um, mm -hmm. on that topic. We looked at the US-China one, which obviously is <laughs> been dated now. Uh, it might, yeah, that, that might be pretty sidelined at this point. Um, but that could be an interesting avenue. And this was a paper called Using Bits to Protect Bites. Um, I'm happy to send it to you. Terrible pun, terrible pun. Oh, I know, I know. Like, yeah. if, if you're writing a bit paper, it has to have a pun in it. It's it, law. it really does. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, have a yeah. bit paper with no pun. <laughs> what? Oh, I like political like, ownership, by the way. <laughs> oh, yay. Thank you. <laughs> and the last thing is, I'm sure you're familiar with it already, but the, the Global Reporting Initiative, the GRI, they have this you know database of 15,000 plus GRI sustainability reports. And we did a thing um, looking at basically parallels between sustainable development and cybersecurity a few years ago, but they were really easy to work with and the World Summit on Stock Exchanges. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, maybe there could be an interesting collaborative opportunity there to get some data. It might be too time intensive to make it worthwhile if you actually have to plow through some of these reports, but maybe there's a way to do, you know, I'll either use our age or find some other tool to make it more manageable, but that could be a nice resource as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's super helpful. I find it fascinating, this is great. And I'm sorry I have to run another meeting, but this is, this is wonderful. And happy so holidays. <laughs> So the queue is open, so do you want to jump? Or? Uh, well, just really, because the courts are such a um, big part of that story, that three-step thing, um, rule of law, as far as being in the model and controlling for that, are you are you kind of thinking that's the same as corruption or polity, or do you think those two variables kind of control for that, or do you think rule of law might be something that might be different? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll want to play around with robustness a lot. Mm -hmm. And check. I, I do. I, I think it is a little bit different, um, mm. but I think it's probably also. So, the I didn't mean to put so much pressure on Marcus here. I think like the the Marcus book I think does a really nice job of laying out this um, this phenomenon of, of takeovers. Um, his book is really much like it's it's very focused on the difference between the central government and like regional governments and and their effects on government predation. Uh, which is something that we're just sort of not not looking at here, but I liked how he laid out this process, and for me that was like a clear way to communicate to you what I, what what we mean by um, takeovers. Uh, but I don't want to like there's there's lots of other people who've worked on that, uh, like Scott Gilbach comes to mind, uh, Constantine Sonin. There's lots of fantastic work in this issue area. Um, I don't want to give those guys short shrift. <laughs> Sorry, am I calling on people? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you focus on immobile assets. Have you looked at categories of immobile assets first? And I'm particularly interested in natural resources. I haven't, but I I, I will. This is not. I think Jess, you asked for this. No, too. Sarah, no. Kind of. I have a I have a follow up to that, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I should like. We can we can look at that. Because I would think, yeah, that would be <coughs> that'd be hugely, you know, if you're if you're in control of timber, coal, whatever, that those kind of things, uh, you, you know, you can't move them very easily unless you cut the trees down or take the coal out. But while it's there, and so it seemed like they would have to play the political game. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I need to to look at that. We've been, we've sort of been thinking about this and like the hold the industry constant and try to look at variation within in like firms within industries. Um, but I, I think that's that's a point well taken. Thank you. I think yeah. I, this is a couple of things to draw on. So we have some time, or not much time, but um, I just the comments you're getting are a lot about sort of the. Um, why do you see the change in ownership when there's other things that aren't quite along those lines, right? And so if this is going to come up in reviews or people want it, people, your response was, well, I don't think that, you know, just changing the board of directors or just making these short mm -hmm. changes isn't going to be enough to satisfy the political interests. Um, so I was looking at your paper and just trying to think about the theory. 
it seems to me that you're you're you're, you're starting you're, you're thinking about the perspective of the firm, right? Not yes. so much the perspective yeah. of the leadership of the country. Yeah, I think that's a right. So you might sort of mm. help get people on board with what you're saying if you just kind of said you, you know walked us walked us through more as an actor kind of model. Mm -hmm. You know, individual actor rationalizing their their profits and faced with the possibility of a new government. And then that might lead you to think about how certain are you that the election is coming up. Rather than writing the paper like you have and then just storing the kitchen sink at the end with all these controls, which maybe mm -hmm. not be as satisfying theoretically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, but I think I think I'm really you know enamored with the piece. But I just think there may be a little more sort of. And that would think about is there is this a decision is this a decision model right? Where there's yeah. some uncertainty about mm -hmm. what the new leader is <clears> going to be or or what's going on right? There's no there's no sort of thought process in the in the story right now about what's going on in the firm ownership's head. Yeah. And that might help you sort of specify the models. The other thing is just real briefly, we had a lot of discussions about dynamics, and, and mm -hmm. I was just trying to think. I was looking at your data. I don't know what you can do. You've only got five yeah. years of data, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was so thinking, you know, I don't know, have you thought about what like a duration model might do, if that makes any sense to try six to get... Six years of data. Six years of data. <laughs> yeah. 2010 and it's, all, it's just six time points, right? So yeah, you might just right. want to be, you right. know, all you can do is sort of lag well, that. Well, we have seven time points, so we, we lost 2009 oh. because we did difference. Oh, right. right? So that, we lost yeah. 2009. Yeah. And maybe yeah. you said this to Sarah, but I didn't catch you, but you know, you can say, well, here's what happens when you look at the ownership contemporaneously last year. You can do that kind of thing, right? Yeah, to sort yeah, of yeah, yeah. talk about that. And your answer was that it doesn't, if you lag at one, it doesn't matter anymore. So in the year before the leadership change, ownership yes. change is elevated. OK. As well as in the year of the leadership change. In the year after the leadership change, there's not much going on. There's not a statistically significant okay. effect, if I remember. And like, let's like, so basically the other years. Okay. So it's, it seems like it's really the year of the leadership change, uh, and there's probably something going on the year before the leadership change as well. Okay. Which we've been interpreting as like firms are able to foresee that this leadership right. change is likely. Um, and so that's that, great because then that sort of suggests again, you know, how much information yeah. do they have? How yeah. certain are they that things are changing? I mean, there's a lot of there's been some research in the OECD where you have we have good polls to sort of actually measure those things, right? You, yeah. You can look at polling data. Now you probably can't do that in most of your cases. You might yeah. have a little bit clep, be a little bit creative. But about. political institutions is going to induce variation in how much information is available, yeah. so um, can... and like, is it a coup or something like that? It was probably unforeseen. Right. Uh, yeah, I think those are that's really yeah. useful. Thank you. Should I see what you shall these things? Well, sort of relatedly, I think in terms of like fleshing out like exactly how these mechanisms playing out, particularly from the perspective of not only the firm, but also potentially the government. It would also be helpful, I think, to, like, you have this really cool, like, you tell the Ukrainian story a bit in here, mm -hmm. and I want to know exactly what kinds of connections are relevant here. Like, yeah. is there any way to get at that? Is there any way to tell whether the changes that you're seeing actually are in some way, like, yeah. even a case, like, if you could look at a case where, like, you could actually observe that the ownership yeah, is this what you were saying? Too. Okay, yeah. where you could sort of see what that is. And then the other question I have is it? I don't know if you would, if this would actually reveal anything different. But do you have information or data on the nature of the change, like whether it is in fact this Raider situation or if it was a benign mm -hmm. purchase? Okay, so you can't. Get I can't that. distinguish that. So. Okay, I was just curious as to whether that would reveal yeah. anything to us. It might not, right? It might just be like the goal looks the same and. For some actors, it's more act like efficient to be the raiders, and for others, it's more efficient to do a straight up like purchase. But I was just, I just didn't know if that would say you had available or not, or reveal anything interesting about the whether there's different mechanisms. That that yeah, I would also imagine that like firms can foresee that they become the target of raiders, and so they're gonna sell right away before going through this really costly process. Like okay, well let's just let's just split the surplus right now, or maybe the the raider takes all the surplus, but let me just get out now. Um, so yeah, I think I, I, uh, we, we have talked a little bit about trying to verify that the people that, okay, so the, the like steps that we've kind of identified as what we want to do next is um, try to verify that some of these people who are taking over the firms do have political connections. So this will probably entail looking at one country in more detail. Um, 
and, and try to make sure that these, these people are, in fact, politically connected. Um, and then and other people know that they're politically connected. Sorry? And it has to be the case, right, that others know yeah. that they're politically connected. It's, yeah, it doesn't necessarily, like as long as they attach a higher, as long as they attach an elevated value to firm ownership, then they offer to pay more okay, for the firm than it's worth to the existing owners. Um, but probably the effect would be larger if other people know that they're politically connected. So yeah, so that's tricky. Like uh, in the literature right now, right, people are using, uh, are these firms located in Western Ukraine? Well, yeah. then they're politically connected when the Western Ukrainian guy comes into power. Uh, but that's like that's a really creative and cool solution, but it's hard to figure out uh, with like on a more fine grained scale who's politically connected. But there there are people who are doing that. I think there's data sets in in China and India, um, and so I, hopefully we can we can look at something like that. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the last two points. Um, oh, yeah. An example might be uh, Mexican Miracles. So Haber and Razo, and there's a third author, uh, the 2003 book. Yeah, I love that book. They go into in depth about how the relations between politicians and these firms mm -hmm. might remain stable despite you know, constant turnover. Yeah. So it might theoretically it might get something out of that. Mm -hmm. And business associations too, so maybe there's mm -hmm. some ability for firms to take collective action. I got to say that in this room. <laughs> um, yeah, me, thank you. Even I'm running out of time. Let me collect so your questions and then we'll start. Hi, uh, I must confess I don't know much at all about uh, the topic of this paper, but I really find it interesting. So um, I have a thank you. In your proposition two, uh, you said that changes in ownership during are more likely in countries with corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is that, uh, can I interpret this as, uh, so political change leading to uh, uh, firm ownership change, that is a bad thing, right? So does that, so, so if, um, I guess my question is, so does it mean that if firm ownership is uh, more consistent, Yeah. Okay, I'll try to be super brief. So um, I just no, don't wanna, worry. I want to hear your comments more than you want to hear mine. I promise. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, kind of echo um, or amplify um, Tim and sort of asking you to kind of walk us through a little bit more um, because what we like what the actual um, causal mechanisms here are mm -hmm. um, because when you um, you set everything up as that this is kind of a firm level story, but then when we press you on many things, um, you said, well, that might not be enough to satisfy the government. So yeah. is the issue that the government is trying to basically um, find opportunities for um, for individuals that are um, in its circle to you know take over means of production, or is this more that mm -hmm. there are opportunities, that, that firms are acting defensively because they know that um, in le if they don't have um, politically connected individuals in ownership or perhaps mm -hmm. management structures that they are not going to have the ear of the government um, over regulatory matters. And those are different, very different stories. Um, and so um, one of the reasons why I kind of push you to think a little bit more about um, 
like maybe your varieties of capitalism approach, or at least read a little bit there. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily, necessarily to say that you need to take that on kind of um, wholesale, but that you know, you've mentioned you mentioned that you don't have the most robust results, and it might be because this works in certain circumstances rather than in others. And so uh, I don't think that country fix effects are enough here, because I think that you could actually explain some of this variation in yeah. your theory. And I think that it is worthwhile to kind of think through that a little bit more, because I think that your theoretical argument will be clearer if, if you kind of go down that route a little bit. And then the other quick thing is on sector specific mm -hmm. um, stuff. My, my point wasn't necessarily that um, there are certain sectors that are more have more tangible assets or not. It's more that there are certain sectors that are more vulnerable to mm -hmm. regulatory capture than others, and that's why I specifically mentioned infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. you might be able to kind of think about the types of um, industries that are subject to greater amount of regulation or that are um, more reliant on procurement. Because mm -hmm. to me, those are the mechanisms through which political connections become particularly valuable. So. Thank you all so much. <laughs> These are fantastic comments. Um, I really, really very much appreciate it. Was that a hand? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't. Oh, I'm, I'm Frank Marshall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't cut you. You had a question, so like, no, I'm sure, no, no, I, I just shut my hand up right now because I was thinking in terms of how to, how to capture, you know, sort of the degree of the political swing too, because, mm -hmm. you know, in a developed, um, you know, welfare state like in Scandinavia, for example, a swing from social democrats to the left party didn't really produce drastic changes in the government, you know, but uh, if you take the opposite of extreme of a country like Venezuela, you know, a change in government means a very major change in, in policy towards, you know, economic development and so forth. So I don't know, maybe you can speak a little more to that, how you're thinking in terms of, of uh, how to capture that. Yeah, I think. So yeah, I think that's a fantastic suggestion too. Uh, so we, we had been thinking about that a little bit with the change in partisanship, um, but I think these comments about how constrained the executive is and how much power the legislature has are probably better ways, or are, are also other ways to think about that that we can explore in the future. Um, but in general, they like thank you so much. I think these comments are really really useful. Uh, I was a little bit nervous to present the project at the. This is like very early stages, but uh, Allison suggested that that was that that's kind of the right time, and I, I think she's right. These comments are really really useful for us, and we're at a stage where they'll really inform the development of the project. So thank you. Uh, and there's food I heard upstairs. Upstairs, so yes, please in the join library. us. Even, you don't even have to talk to me if you don't want to. <laughs>